Give me a clue, Daniel. Give me a cue. Folks, good morning. Yeah, I, I think I got pretty good volume here. Lead vocal, yeah. Right. All right, well, yay, folks, good morning, welcome. Uh huh. Some of you I hear come in, it's the first time you've seen the, the new sanctuary. Praise the Lord, what a blessing, what a gift. He did this, and he did it through many people, most, a lot of people in the fellowship and outside. That's been exciting, so welcome. God bless you, and uh, what's that? Somebody said no. <laughs> well, we respond to uh, the audience here, so <clears throat> that's, uh, so you can interrupt sermons. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Andrew's not going to like that. Um, let's, uh, rem uh, let's remember, I want to ask you to remember in prayer, Kathy Takis, she's with her mother, who ha she had to take to the uh, emergency last night, so, but she's all right, she's fine, and she's home, her mother's home, but she's with her, and so that we need to pray, lift them in prayer. Um, just a lot of stuff going on in her family, and Kathy's there, bless her heart, so we want to remember her in prayer. Also, please remember uh, Lisa um, um, DeLapp, because she had knee replacement surgery yesterday, and was supposed to come home today, but she's not been doing well, so she'll, Lord willing, be coming home tomorrow. Please remember her and Scott in prayer, our missionaries uh, to Central America, and uh, so... Uh, we want to remember them, and if there's an, any other prayers uh, to remember, share that among each other today, shall we? That would be good. So, And then again, also this week, remember we, we have uh, Mo um, at uh, 6.30 tomorrow night on Zoom, and then uh, the women of Enclave, I don't want to say whoa, it just sounds so weird. In, women of Enclave, that sounds better. That's 6.45 on Zoom on Tuesday nights. And uh, you want to check out villages or communities, then in the bulletin, see, look for the word, the uh, numbers that we have there. Uh, youth tonight, we'll meet at 3 p.m. here. Um, we're kind of in the building and out of the building. We're just enjoying the sunshine. So, um, And uh, as well, I want to thank everyone that uh, joined us on Zoom last night for our uh, night of prayer. It looked like we had 21 uh, folks check it out. So that was a nice little number of prayer uh, gathering as we met here also with some folks. It was a blessed time of prayer. Well, let's uh, prepare our hearts now to enter into the scripture and then into the word. So my uh, beloved wife will come and read this morning's passage to us. Good morning. And when the 10 heard it, they became, began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word, how you renew us and encourage us in our trust in you, on our love and adoration of you, Lord. We ask today that you would use this passage to help us to become more like you, to, to be changed, and to follow you, Lord. Thank you. In your name we ask this. 
and for your sake, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, Wendy, it's good to see all of you who were able to uh, make it uh, today. We're still doing uh, Facebook Live as, as well, so um, there's that opportunity for those who weren't able to come here. Um, but I'm glad to see everybody who has been able to come. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the topic of uh, leadership. And for some of you, maybe that causes you to squirm in your chair a little bit when we talk about the topic of leadership and, and authority. But regardless of whether you like those ideas or not, we have to admit kind of that leadership is everywhere, right? It's part of our life. We have leaders in government, leaders in the military, leaders in our schools. Some of us are called to be leaders in the home, leaders in the church. There are managers who manage teams and businesses. There are CEOs who play the role of, of leaders. So wherever you look, you're going to find leadership, right? It's a big part of our life. But what constitutes good leadership? So we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. What what is, what is good leadership? Now, if you Google that, you're going to have like a million answers. You're going to be invited to conferences, T-shirts to buy. There, you can buy a poster about it with a cat on it probably. There's all kinds of things you can learn about leadership online. So just to kind of give us a taste of what is out there in the world regarding leadership, I'm going to look at three quotes here at the beginning from those who are regarded as experts in leadership in the world to get a taste of, of, of what's out there. The first um, quote we're going to look at is from somebody named Jocko Wilkin, uh, Willink. So here, here he is. Um, probably you can tell even by how he looks. He's an ex-Navy Marine, highly decorated uh, Navy Marine. He is the co-founder of the Echelon Front, right, which is a, a leadership, um, a premier leadership consulting firm. So he's won a lot of awards in that. And he is a best-selling author of a book called Extreme Ownership, How the Navy Seals Lead and Win. So you can kind of see where this is going, I think. So let's, this is the longest quote, by the way. The other ones are shorter. But this is what Jocko says. The only meaningful measure for a leader is whether the team succeeds or fails. For all the definitions, descriptions, and characterizations of leaders, uh, there are only two that matter, effective and ineffective. Effective leaders lead successful teams that accomplish their mission and win. Ineffective leaders do not. So how is he defining leadership in terms of what? In terms of, yeah, winning, basically winning, accomplishing a mission. OK, so that's interesting. Let's go on to the next one. All right, so this is another example from Indra Nui. So she is the CEO, or she was, she's no longer. But she was the CEO of, of the Pepsi company. She's won all kinds of awards in leadership, and at one point, Forbes magazine named her the third most powerful woman in the world. We had never, I had never heard of her before, but apparently she was the third most powerful woman in the word, so, world. So here's her definition of leadership. She says, leadership is hard to define and good leadership even harder. But if you can get people to follow you to the ends of the earth, you are a great leader. Okay, that's kind of an interesting uh, definition of leadership. So, She's defining leadership in terms of what? Like gaining followers. So that's how she defines leadership. Loyal followers that are willing to follow you anywhere. So let's, let's, this is our last one. This is from somebody. Um, his name is Warren Bennis. So he is the founding chair of the Leadership Institute of the University of South Carolina. Sometimes he's called the, um, the, 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 the Dean of Leadership Gurus. Right, because he's like a, a pioneer in this field. Like we didn't have a lot of degrees in leadership before this guy uh, came along. And this is how he defines leadership. Leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. So 
how's he defining leadership? Like in terms of having uh, the ability to make a, a vision come into to reality. All right, so that's kind of, we could probably appreciate maybe bits and pieces of, of these quotes. But what we want to know is, what does Jesus say? Right, because Jesus is our leader. He's our king. And in the passage that we're going to look at this morning, we kind of have what Jesus says about leadership as he addresses what leadership looks like in the kingdom with his disciples. But before we go um, too far into that, let's think about the occasion and the setting um, for this teaching of Jesus. So if you remember uh, last week, right after Jesus gave his third prediction regarding his death and his resurrection, James and John come along and what do they do? They ask for positions of authority, right? And leadership. They want to be the greatest leaders in Jesus' kingdom. So we can read about the request in verse 37 uh, from last week, Mark chapter 10. They ask, they say, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. And the parallel passage in Matthew says, in your kingdom. We want to be the highest ranking leaders in your kingdom. And remember Jesus' answer was to say, well, I can't tell you where you're going to sit in the kingdom, but I can, I can promise you this, that you'll have a baptism like mine and you'll have a cup like mine. And so last week we spent some time digging into what Jesus meant by that. But this week, now we get to see the disciples' reaction to this exchange between James, John, and Jesus. So our passage this morning begins in verse 41, as Wendy read, and there we read, and when the ten heard it, the other ten disciples heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. So evidently, the other disciples hear this exchange between Jesus, James, and John. And do they like it? No, they do not like it. They are mad. So why do you think that they're mad? Maybe they're mad because, well, they're being really insensitive, right? Like Jesus has just talked about how he's going to die. Maybe, maybe they're insensitive that immediately after Jesus does that, like they're turning it back on themselves. Maybe that's why they're mad, you think? No. <laughs> that's, that is not why they're, they're mad. Maybe they're mad or frustrated because they're saying, man, Jesus has just been telling us over and over and over again. The Gospel of Mark is just over and over and over again what Jesus' kingdom is about. And James and John are just not getting it. Is that why they're mad? No, <laughs> that's not why they're mad. They're mad because they want to be the greatest in the kingdom. And James and John beat them to the punch here. I say, so remember in Mark chapter 9, after Jesus gave his second prediction regarding his death and resurrection. What were the disciples talking about then? Right? Who's the greatest? They were arguing over who was the greatest. So James and John, right? they don't understand the nature of Jesus' kingdom, but neither do any of the other disciples. And so Jesus takes this opportunity, sort of like as a, as a teaching moment, right, to address them about leadership, in the kingdom, and so he has kind of like this group huddle, and they talk about what leadership looks like. What leadership looks like, one, in the world, that's our first point. Then what leadership looks like in his kingdom, that's our second point. And what leadership looks like in his life, in Jesus' own life. So what does Jesus say that leadership looks like in the world? Well, look with me again in verse 42. There we read, And Jesus called them and said to them, You know, everyone knows this, Jesus says, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. So this is an example of synonymous parallelism. By that I mean Jesus is saying one thing, in two different ways, right? Gentile rulers, Gentile great ones, same thing. What do they do? 
they lord it over, they lord their authority over, and they exercise their authority over those in their, in their charge. Now, when you look at these two verbs, lord it over and exercise authority over, uh, both of them have a prefix attached to them that lets the reader know that the leadership that we're talking about is negative and oppressive. So Jesus is saying, everybody knows that in the world, leadership is harsh, self-serving, and oppressive, right? And he knows that they know because it's part of, you know, are the disciples, what nationality are they? They're Israelite, right? So they're Jews. Part of the national identity of the Jews is to be under oppressive leadership. That's kind of like been their whole history. It's how their history began, if you remember. In Exodus chapter 1, right, when Pharaoh notices that the Israelites have grown in number and grown in might, he says that the Egyptians should, and this is Exodus 1.11, set taskmasters over them to afflict heavy burdens. And then if you skip down to verse 13 and 14, Regarding the Egyptians, it says, quote, they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service. And then if you keep reading in Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh ultimately decides to do what? He orders all the Israelite children to be, the male ones, to be killed at birth. So their history began with oppressive leadership. Now, it doesn't get much better, by the way, when they take over it themselves. If you remember, at one point, the Israelites say, we want a king like what? Like the other nations. We want, we want a king like the other nations. And Samuel's like, no, 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 you don't. And they're like, yes, we do. And then what happens? They get kings. And how does that turn out? It just gets more oppressive, there's more injustice than the, the north goes. They start to act like Egypt, actually. The north goes to Assyria. The south is taken captive under Babylon. Two more oppressive kingdoms. In Habakkuk chapter 1, it says of the, the Babylonians that they, they sweep through like fishermen, right? And they conquer and oppress nations to make themselves wealthy. So oppressive leadership in Egypt, self-serving leadership in Babylon. They've been under this before. And now who are they under? They're under the Romans. Right? Same kind of deal. So Peter uses the word Babylon as a code word to talk about the Roman Empire in 1 Peter. And then what have we learned about the readers of Mark? What are they under? The oppression of Emperor Nero, who is sending them to wild animals to be torn apart, right, and then using them as human torches to light his garden at night. So both Jesus' disciples and the first readers of Mark are well acquainted with self-serving, oppressive, leadership. And so are we. We're used to that too because what's in the headlines in the news all the time? Abuses of power. Abuses of power. Oppressive leadership. And some of us have been the victims of that. Some of us have been the perpetrators of abuses of power. And I think most of us would have to say, if, if we're real honest with ourselves, that we've been on both sides of that ledger, right? We've been victims and we've been perpetrators of abuse of power and authority because we're sinners, right? And that's part of our makeup. And the normal human strategy to deal with oppression is this. And, and think, about, <laughs> think about the past year, okay? The, the normal reaction to oppression is to figure out a way to overturn the oppressors so that you can be in charge and do what? 
oh, press. That's, that's the way that that kind of works. That's how, and that's how, I think, the disciples, with their, their expectations of the Messiah in the first century, that, I think that's how they regarded Rome. Right? We'll be in charge, and then we'll be the oppressors. But then Jesus is saying, let's put, pump the brakes here, right? and, and uh, let's point in a different direction. So this, this brings us to our second point. Leadership in Jesus' kingdom. So let's remind ourselves of what Jesus said um, in verse 42 and then read on through verse 44. Jesus said in verse 42, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. And so here again is an example of synonymous parallelism. Jesus is saying one thing in two different ways. He says if you want to be great, same root word as great ones of the Gentiles, by the way. If you want to be great, well, then you're going to have to be a servant. And if you want to be first, then you're going to have to be a slave. So Jesus is not anti-leadership and authority, right? But he is anti-oppressive, self-serving authority. And so what Jesus is saying, it's not just about changing who's in power. It's about thinking about power and leadership differently altogether. In Jesus' kingdom, leadership doesn't look the same, or at least it shouldn't, look the same as it does in the world. In Jesus' kingdom, if you are a leader, then that means putting yourself under the people that you lead in order to lift them up, to willingly and on purpose put those that you serve over you. That's what leadership looks like in the kingdom of God. And that has implications for Christian leadership in every sphere of life. Are you called to be a leader in your home? Well, that means that you're called to serve those in your home. Are, are you called to be a leader at your job? Well, that means that you serve those in your job. Are you called to lead your kids? And parents, you are. Right? What does that mean? This one might be the hardest pill to swallow. It means to serve your children. What does it mean in the church for church leaders? You come under the people that you serve in order to lift them up. Peter talks about this in his letter first, uh, in First Peter, in chapter five. He's addressing a group of elders. So in the New Testament. Church leaders, the position is called elders, and they do two things. They pastor and they bishop. So you've heard of elders, pastors, bishops. Well, elders pastor and they bishop. That means they shepherd and they oversee. Bishop is usually translated oversee, and we're going to see that in this passage. Don't get caught up in all that. He's addressing church leaders. That's good enough for now. And he says this to elders, shepherd or pastor, the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion. Right? You're not being forced to, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So Peter's saying people don't need more self-serving, oppressive, hypocritical leaders like the world offers plenty, plenty of that. What, what they need are examples of chief servants. So, so that's the calling of every Christian leader. And it is a calling that it, it's not hard, it's impossible. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. Right, and that's, that's where the gospel comes in. 
It's impossible without being tied to Jesus, abiding, having a close relationship with Jesus. As he fills you, then this calling can be played out. And that's what this, this next part of, of the message is about. Because who, okay, this is, you know, this is the answer I know you're going to know. Who is the most powerful leader in the scene right now? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, Jesus is the most powerful leader in the scene right now. And what is first, what, the first half of Mark, what has it been all about? Jesus is a king with power. And he demonstrates it in all these different kinds of, of ways. But now, as we go into the second half of Mark, he's going to show that he is not only a king with power, but he exercises that rule as the chief servant. He didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Philippians chapter 2 tells us. So the whole gospel of Mark is about this. And now we turn to the, our third point. So what does leadership look like in Jesus' life? And we're going to turn to a verse that is maybe the most important verse in the Gospel of Mark. Some say one of the most important verses in the New Testament to understand Jesus and his kingdom. This is verse 45. There Jesus says, For, so he said, don't lead like the Gentiles. We lead differently because, now he's going to say, here's why, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So now Jesus is giving himself as the chief example of the kind of leadership that he's talking about, which would be supremely arrogant if it wasn't true. But it is true regarding Jesus. And he does this first by identifying himself as the Son of Man. Right? And we've talked about this before. Right? So when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, this is his favorite designation for himself, what he's doing is he's referencing a uh, prophecy from the prophet Daniel, right? Daniel has a vision in Daniel chapter 7. And there we read, beginning in verse 13, And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. So he's like a man, but he's more than a man. And he came to the ancient of days, that is God the Father, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. So James and John were right. right? Jesus is going to come into glory. He's going to come into a kingdom. They're right about that. They just don't quite understand the nature of it yet. And was uh, <coughs> in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So no one has more power or more authority than Jesus because he's the son of man. No one has more right to be served than Jesus because he is the son of man. But Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, that even the son of man, even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve. And so his, his leadership, Jesus is our Jesus. His leadership is radically other-centered. <laughs> radically. And he does it willingly. Jesus said, no one takes my life. You think Pilate took Jesus' life? The Romans? The Jewish leaders? No one takes Jesus' life. He's the son of No one takes my life. I give it of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and the power to raise it up again. It's Jesus' power. But he, but he lays it down. He lays it down willingly because Jesus' leadership is the opposite of oppression. It's empowering. Th those of you who know Jesus, 
know that his leadership is empowering and liberating. Jesus, in verse 45, let's read it again. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, this, this word ransom is wildly important in, in the New Testament. It basically means the price of release. It, it's part of a group of words that are based on a root word that means to loosen, like to loosen the ties around an animal that's bound up is, is one example. Right? So, and it carries with it the idea of being released from bondage. So think about being tied up and then being untied. So we're talking about words like, so the verbal form of ransom is redeem. So we're talking about redeem, redeemer, ransom, ransomed, redemption. All of those are the same group of words with the same uh, root to, to all of them. Now outside of the Bible, these words are used to talk about the price of release of a slave. So we want to release this slave. We pay this ransom. And it's used as the price of release for somebody who is a prisoner of war. Is how it's used outside of the Bible. Inside the Bible, in the, in the Old Testament, in the Greek translation of it, it's used in various contexts to talk about the price of release. For example, in Leviticus chapter 25, you pay a price of release to, uh, uh, for your family member who has uh, put themselves into slavery. They've sold themselves into slavery. You can pay a price, you can pay a ransom, and that releases them from slavery. In Exodus chapter 21, we have this case law, an interesting case law regarding an ox and his owner, okay? So the ox, who has a history of goring people, okay, he gets out again, right? The owner knows he has a history of goring people. He gets out again, and then he gores someone to death. The ox does, right? So what happens to the owner of the ox in Exodus chapter 21? Well, that's the death penalty under the law, unless, unless somebody pays a ransom. They pay the price of his release from the death penalty. Right? So there's another example. And then throughout the Old Testament, Yahweh is seen, our Lord is seen as redeeming his people out from under oppression. So he redeems his people from Egypt in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8. He redeems them from Babylon in Micah 4. 10, he redeems them from their sin in Psalm 130, and he redeems them from the grave in Psalm 49. You see where this is all going, right? So this is all setting up to Jesus. Right? He pays the release price, and what does it cost him? His own blood. So he ransoms people, he ransoms those of us who belong to him. From our captivity, we were enslaved to sin. He frees us from sin and from our prison, because we're a prisoner of war, to the devil. And he pays the price of his own blood. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, it says this, You were ransomed, from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. I love that part. Not like cheap things like silver and gold. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So the whole Old Testament sacrificial system also, it's all coming to a head in Jesus. Jesus gives himself, his blood, as the spotless Lamb of God to purchase sinners with his blood to die in their place. Ransom 
for many. The word for there is a word, not the regular word for for, it's a word that means in place of. So the idea of substitution is there. So this is what Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He says, I am the son of man. I'm the son of man. No one has greater authority than me. And yet, I don't lord my authority over people. That's, that's, I mean, that is so shocking. I don't lord my authority over people like the Gentiles do. Instead, I give myself, like think about the ox and the ox owner, I give myself over to the death penalty in your place to release you from your slavery. Right? And a lot of people don't know that they're slaves. But those of you who know Jesus, you remember, and even times we feel like we're drawing back into it, slavery to sin, a prisoner of war of the devil. Right? Jesus ransoms us out of that. That's the gospel. Because he says, I'm not just the son of man of Daniel chapter 7. I am the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, of which this verse is an echo. Isaiah 53, 10 says this of the suffering servant, that he would be an offering for guilt. It says regarding him that he poured out his soul to death and was numbered among the transgressors, and that he bore the sins of Many. So you can hear the echoes of Isaiah 53 in our passage. So that means for us, if you're a follower of Jesus, you've united yourself to Jesus by faith, you've been ransomed. A price has been paid for you. You have been blood bought, right? And so that means, what are you ransomed out of? Slavery. So that means you're no longer a slave. It means you're now a son and daughter of God. And that you sit with Jesus where? In Ephesians chapter 2. In heavenly places already. So think about what James and John are asking Jesus. Hey, can we sit at your right hand and at your left hand? They have this whole different idea of the kingdom. Right? And, and Ephesians 2 tells us, in Christ, you are with Jesus at the right hand of God the Father. So in other words, there is no higher position. There isn't one. Right? So what, is that, what would that mean if we, if we believed that? Because we don't believe. I mean, we're beginning to believe it, right, if you're a follower of Jesus. We're starting to kind of believe that we are in that position in Jesus. Right? But if you're in that position and you believed it, there's no need to step over anybody. Like, where, where are you going to go higher than at the right hand of God the Father in Jesus? There's, no, there's nobody to step over. Right? So you're, you're not going to step over anybody. You're not going to lord your measly, earthly authority over anybody at Pizza Hut. <laughs> like, like, what are you... It doesn't even make any kind of sense if we have the highest position that there already is. And see, we've been, we've been freed from the ways of the world. So now we're free to serve. This is the kind of leadership that Jesus came to free you for, to serve. So now we get to. We get to serve in our home. We get to serve in our jobs. We get to serve in churches. It's totally, totally different with Jesus. But see, so don't get confused by this. I'm not saying, hey, you know what, you really ought to do that. No, I'm just saying, take your temperature. Because if you say like, oh, I, 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 Andrew, I believe that, I know that, I know this verse, I've studied it, you know. I can write a doctrinal statement about that verse. Okay, fine. Do you oppress people? Because if you oppress people, that means you don't 
believe it. You, maybe you're beginning to believe it, and we're all in a process, right? But that's the temperature. You oppress people, you've got a temperature. And what do you do when you have a temperature? Do you, do you try to be like, okay, let me just let me slow my heart down? No. You go to the doctor. Right? So take inventory of your life. Do you oppress your kids? <laughs> do you oppress people at work? Do you oppress your family members? Is it hard to live in your home? <laughs> and Jesus says, look, you don't have to do that anymore. You're free now. Because now you sit in the heavenlies with me. Today, um, we celebrate when Jesus paid the price to ransom us from our sins as we take communion. So hopefully as you came in, you got one of these. I don't even know what to call these. Little communion packet. I see some of you struggling. <laughs> Takes a lot of fine motor skills, I know. <clears throat> so the bread represents Jesus giving his body to liberate us. Let's take and eat. The juice represents the price that Jesus paid to have you be part of his family. Let's take and drink. Let's pray together. Father, you are here in our midst. And Lord, you want to speak to each one of us. And Lord, I pray that you would. But for that, God, I, I pray that you would unplug our ears and open our eyes. Have these truths take root into our hearts. And by that, Lord, we mean that the one who is the truth would be our very life, God, that we would abide in him today and this week. Lord, we don't want to be oppressors anymore. I mean, part of us does. But, Lord, we want that part to die. And so, Lord, bring new life. And make us like you, God, for your glory's sake. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be in the back, and we'll sing in the backyard. Can you join me there? <clears throat>